Hi everyone, good evening. It is 7.30, it's time for our live Q&A on picky eating tonight. I wanted to let you guys know Patricia's running a bit late. Uh, many of you are schooling your kids at home right now, so it's a little hectic to say the least, so she'll be here in a few minutes. Um, but what I wanted to do is kind of give a topic for this evening, and as uh, you guys have other questions about development or things like that, um, you can go ahead and put those in the, uh, right in the question, and that way um, I can answer it when I see it come through. We did do something a little bit different this time is we had you guys, um, those of you that confirmed that you were attending tonight, we asked you a couple questions. We asked you, um, do you have a child who's a picky eater, yes or no? And then what's your picky eater's favorite uh, foods? And then what are you hoping to learn about this evening? So I wanted to thank those of you that sent in those um, answers and questions uh, just to give us a little bit of context to get us started this evening. So um, I know that Patricia's got some things to say about this as well. So she'll be joining us shortly. She is on her way. Um, so I think what I wanna do is kind of get into some of the questions that you asked in advance, just to kind of get us started. And as you guys have questions, if you wanna type them in for me, that would be very helpful. Um, so I can read them on the screen and kind of make sure I'm addressing the things that you wanna talk about this evening. Uh, like I said, I just kind of want to have a topic to get us started, but if you guys got, if you guys have any other developmental questions, feel free to, to ask those. So um, what's funny is when I look at, I printed out all the questions and answers to the things that you guys asked in advance. And when I look at all of the favorite foods, all the favorite foods are carbohydrates and dairy. So I'll go down the list. This is, um, it, you guys, it's like you all just really answered the same question. Uh, mac and cheese, pizza, spaghetti, cookies, french fries, bread, noodles, pizza, yogurt. Um, so nobody actually said m milk, which is, I haven't, you know, I was kind of surprised. Um, but the, um, the carbohydrates that the kids are, kids are usually wanting to eat the things that they're uh, craving and also the foods that they have made a positive association with. So when kids are growing up uh, and, and starting to eat their first foods and things like that, they are associating, you know, do I like it? Do I not like it? Do I, does it smell weird? Does it have a weird texture? You know, whatever it is. And if they like it, they continue eating it. If they don't, they don't. Um, and so we start, you know, picky eating. Most of the children are picky eating because of pain. So I have a whole chapter in my book about picky eating um, because it's so important. It's such an important aspect of how we can tell something is wrong or something needs to be looked at further. So if I have a picky eater, I know that there's something going on digestively causing discomfort, which is causing them to be very picky about what they'll eat. Most of the time they're gonna eat carbohydrates. Uh, they're gonna crave them. Sometimes that's because they, they want the, you know, they're feeding yeast or something they have going on. Other times it's soothing. I mean, think about it when you're nauseous, when you're sick, you know, what do we tell people to eat? We tell people to eat like crackers and toast and things like that, carbohydrates, right? Come here, sorry. I think you guys all know Mr. Furley. He's here tonight has to be up on our lap. So anyway, um, but kids will start associating pain with food. I've seen it as early as a year, uh, sometimes earlier. And I think when you guys are going to the doctor and thinking, well, if they were in pain, they would complain. No, they don't. Imagine if you had a slight belly ache your whole life and that was your normal. Everyone has a normal. So if they didn't, if, you know, they don't know any better, basically, right? And 
some people say, well, maybe they have an allergy to a food. Well, most people say, well, they don't have an allergy because they haven't had a rash or they haven't broken out in hives or they didn't get any swelling. And that, that doesn't need to be the case either. Um, you can have a food sensitivity and still be, you know, reactive. You know, you can still have behavior issues. You can still have sleeping issues. You can have bowel movement issues aside from picky eating. So usually picky eating does not come alone. It's not really the only thing. I got my skinny girl margarita. I don't know if you guys have tried it, but the skinny girl brand of, I got the peach margarita. This is delicious. You know, when you're working out and on a diet, you need to think about alcohol that you can drink while you're, while you're on this. So this is fantastic for any of you that want to pick it up. Um, so anyway, the, uh, so that's picky eating kind of in a nutshell about when it comes to pain, discomfort, things like that. The other thing is there's a, there's a lot of things you guys have probably read that kids crave the things that are sometimes the worst for them. Right. Um, so most of the time I have kiddos go on, uh, gluten and casein free diets, which is funny because most of what they're eating is gluten and casein. So gluten is all your pastas, pizzas, yogurts, noodles, all that fun stuff, not yogurt, excuse me, noodles. Casein is your goat, sheep and cow dairy. Now there's really great options. Like the yogurt, uh, the one that put yogurt is what they want to eat. You can do a coconut milk yogurt. That's non dairy that tastes the same. It's very, very good. It's by the brand. So delicious. So you can try that. All of you want your kids to eat more foods and have more options. And the truth is that's not going to happen unless you get down to the root cause of what is causing the pain in the first place. So for me, we bring the kids in, we go through, I ask a bunch of questions because I want to be able to see what else other than the picky eating is going on that we need to address or we need to, to figure out. Stool and urine and blood will tell you everything you need to know about why your kiddo is not eating well. Um, food therapy typically doesn't work. Uh, feeding therapy, most parents sort of fail out of it, um, honestly. And it's really because, again, if, the, if, if feeding therapy isn't helping, it's because your child isn't necessarily not, it's not that he doesn't, he or she doesn't want to eat more food. It's that if eating this food caused you pain, there's no way you would get it in their mouth, correct? So. That's why feeding therapy a lot of times will, will fail because your kid is in pain and they are desperately trying to control their environment, control what goes in. Contr you know, they only can control what goes in their mouth and what comes out of their bottom. So other than that, you're under, you, you have full control of your kiddos. So, um, but I've seen these little commercials for uh, those cutouts, you can make them in star shapes or dinosaur shapes, and then it makes them want to eat them. I'm sure some of you've tried, you know, tried that stuff. And a lot of times you get very frustrated with the fact that they won't try anything. A lot of the kids that I start under care don't necessarily flip a switch and all of a sudden they're eating, you know, like a foodie. It takes a little bit of time. It takes, it takes time to fix the problem. It takes time for them to convince themselves it's no longer an issue. And then they start doing things like picking up the food and smelling it or touching it or putting it in their mouth and spitting it back out. And as much as we don't like that, it's a really good sign that they're headed in the right direction because eventually they're going to take something off your plate and eat it. Um, but it is a, it's a process, right? And the process, part of it is figuring out what, why it's happening. Um, for those of you that might be wondering, what could it be? Um, it's kind of a myriad of things typically. So I'll kind of give you the, the typical case from 13 years of experience. So typically the kids are in pain. Uh, there's lots of inflammation in their gut when we see the lab results. And that, it, that comes from um, digestive issues, like not digesting down their food correctly, right? There's fibers, muscle fibers, uh, coming out in their stool, vegetable fibers, things like that, which, or some parents will say, I see undigested food in their stool. Uh, those, those issues are, are part of their discomfort. Of course, a bad bacteria, a parasite, yeast, those are issues as well that will cause them to feel 
bloated, nauseous. Um, I always tell parents when you're bloated, and I think every, every parent has felt that, whether you've had food poisoning or you're on your cycle and you're having cramps and you're bloated or, you know, all these other reasons why you can be bloated, uh, you have that feeling of being full where, where it's like the idea of eating is just a non-negotiable. So I think that in that case, they don't eat very much. So some of the kids eat very picky diets and then the amount that they're eating isn't a lot, which is then getting us to the point where we have an underweight kid. Um, you know, the kid that you haven't bought a uniform for school or you haven't had to buy new shorts for summer because he still fits into his shorts from last summer. So weight gain is a major, is a major issue uh, because if they're not digesting properly and they're not eating nutrient rich foods and they're not supplemented properly, you can't grow, right? You can't grow this way and you can't grow this way. So how, where are you on the percentile, right? For weight and height, which we all, we all take when you come in for a pediatric visit, my office or anybody else that you see because we want to know where you are, right? For your height, for your weight. So I think it's, I think that's important to remember too. If you're, if you're kind of like, wow, they look bloated, but they're not gaining weight. They look fat or chubby or whatever, but they've got these real skinny limbs and they don't seem to gain any weight. Um, there's something going on in that gut, right? And if I felt bloated and my, my tummy was a little bit uncomfortable, um, you can't get me to eat anything I think is going to be dangerous. What else? Um, I think when you switch a diet to a gluten and casein free diet, I think it becomes all about making things look the same. You know, the crackers that they like, the cereal that they like, the texture, is it crunchy? Is it soft? Is it, you know, all of these things. There are so many options out there for gluten and casein free diet it is it is one of the easiest ones to follow and really the most bang for your buck uh, there's a website i refer all my families to called thrivemarket.com it's a subscription based sort of grocery store if you will you pay a 50 dollars subscription a year and you get access to everything that the specialty markets sell like whole food central market all that fun stuff at a discount so not only do you get tons of options, right? More, you know, five, six, 10 different cracker options, but you're also saving money. So there's that, that you'd want to consider, you know, looking at options online. For my older kiddos that, uh, you know, my seven, eight, nine-year-olds that are a, a bit more, I mean, they've had seven, eight or nine years of discomfort and picky eating. So a lot of times I tell them, I'm going to give you this website and I want you to go grocery shopping online with your mom. And a lot of times when you get them involved in the process, they do a really, they do a really nice sort of turnaround. Um, so I think that's something that's important is to get them involved. Another good idea is if you're buying something new, uh, it's a good idea to give more than one option and, and almost make it like it's a contest. You know, the whole family is going to vote on what, what they like the best. And so it becomes sort of like a contest or sort of something that the whole family is doing. And it's fun. It's not something that's torturous. Um, so it, it would be something you'd want to think about doing. Because I always say kids like having a sense of control. So if they have a sense of control that they're controlling what they eat, then it's sort of, they, they feel like they're controlling it, even though you're giving them three options of stuff that you would want them to eat you don't care which one they choose, right? So that's something important is trying to make sure that they have choices because they do want a sense of control. I would say at the age of six and up. So there's, um, those of you that are on the line, um, can you guys type in your questions that you may have? And I want to make sure that you guys are still hearing me okay because I know I've, um, I've cut out in the past and I did not connect the same way I did a couple weeks ago when we were on the phone. I forgot to do that. So I'm sort of hoping that this line stays, stays okay. Um, so I'm not, I don't see any questions here. I think someone had asked about, um, maybe about options. I think, when, when it comes to food, food can be both healing and harmful, right? And 
right now because you, we don't really know what's going on with your kiddo. Um, specifically, some re really great things that I don't think hurt anybody is uh, doing bone broths. So bone broths, you can look up a bunch of recipes online. They're really, really great for gut healing. Um, so something you might want to look up and do. Um, probiotics can help, but it's it's going to do very little to help, honestly. The, these issues that I'm talking about don't get fixed with a simple probiotic. It just doesn't happen that way. So something to keep in mind there certainly doesn't hurt, but it's not going to be as advantageous as, um, as you may be hoping. So I want to set your expectations where they need to be just in case you don't notice really any change. Um, let's see, what else? The... When you're switching from gluten, let's say, because most of the most of the stuff on here your kids are eating is gluten. So your mac and cheese, pizza, noodles, cookies, French fries are going to be okay. You're almost here's here's why you're safe almost anywhere you go for French fries. Um, French fries are if you go to a place that has their own section where they're frying their French fries, right? Where you know anyone, any, any major fast food chain does. So you're good. Arby's, the ones that have like the weird coating on them, uh, that's a no. But anywhere you go, any restaurant you go that has their own fryers, meaning it's not a fryer that's also frying chicken nuggets, onion rings, chicken fried steak, french fries, right? Because the cross contamination, because they don't change that grease out very often, um, ends up causing a reaction. That when you change a diet and you cheat, or you are what I like to fondly refer to as poisoned because that's what it feels like to me when I get gluten. Um, you notice it and it's, it's, not, it's not comfortable and it can last anywhere from a day to three days. So it's no fun and everybody's reaction is different. I can't tell you, hey, you know, your reaction will be this, my reaction will be that. Most parents realize how important the diet changes are once they get something at school or they get something at church or something, you know, something happens, a flub happens, which it always does. Um, then they kind of realize, wow, this is, this is really helping more than I thought, or it's really affecting their behavior more than I realized. So that's something to think about. Um, I'm not sure what else you guys would want me to talk about from here? So you're going to need to put in some questions specifically, whether they're about picky eating or not. Patricia is here. Um, she actually just got here, so she's on her way up. Um, but if you guys have questions, um, like I said, whether it's, you know, picky eating or not, let's Let's kind of get into that because I think those of you that got on late, you can go back and listen to the stuff that I already said about picky eating. I might repeat myself if you ask me a question though. So, um, so I just got a question. I think you guys, I don't know if you guys can see this. It says, when my son was born, he had reflux up until six months. He used to eat everything we gave him to try then it stopped. He's now three. He always struggled with constipation. We've tried probiotics and that doesn't seem to help. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff going on. Um, let me tell Patricia to come in. That way I don't have to get up and leave. Um, so, okay, let me go back and start with the reflux. So, so when a baby has, pick him up otherwise he's not going to be quiet come here i am trying to pick you up furly come here come he's so excited he's like running in circles um okay so Reflux, a lot of the babies, like when we do an intake, hi. All right, Patricia's here, everybody. So I'm gonna have you sit right there because then you'll be able to get in the, okay. get in. 
So squeeze oh. on in. Oh my gosh, oh. you're so obnoxious. Hello. Hi, everyone. This is Patricia. There's your cocktail. Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, let me go back. Sorry. So the reflux. A lot of the kids actually that had picky eating later started with reflux early. Reflux is um, sometimes a food issue, right? It's causing discomfort. Um, sometimes it's a milk intolerance. Sometimes it's something if you're breastfeeding, something mom is eating, etc. Usually, and sometimes it's that you started foods too early before they were ready or before they had, you know, the enzymes to digest food. So you sort of are setting them up for a little bit of a problem potentially. Um, so, and usually they do, they eat everything for a period of time. And then at some point they say enough is enough. I can't give you a good idea of when picky eating really s starts because it's all over. I have people that say before they were a year old. Um, so now, and, and like I was saying earlier, I don't know if you were on the call, but I was saying that usually picky eating doesn't come by itself. So your son struggled with reflux and then picky eating and, and also constipation. And you can imagine those things are pretty tied in close. So usually the picky eating is because of pain, like I was saying before. And then uh, probiotics do little do a little bit to help that because if, if you've got something going on in your gut that's causing inflammation, probiotics are not gonna solve that problem. They're not gonna clear up an infection, a yeast issue, a parasite, or a bacterial issue. Um, so, sorry everyone. So, I think what I would recommend is that you get testing done. If you got urine, stool, and blood work done, we, we would know exactly what's going on. Um, typically, between 24 and 36 months or when kids start showing delays as a result of the digestive stuff that's going on. So because he's sort of on that enough, because he's sort of on that border and just turned three, um, I would... I would get testing sooner than later. It's always good to kind of get early intervention before you start seeing a developmental issue. And I tie all of that together in my book. If you want to get a copy of the book on Amazon, um, it's 15 things your doctor doesn't know about your child. And it goes through where developmental delays start. And I start basically where, where, you're, where you started, which is with reflux. And I kind of take it through there. That's not to say every kid that has had reflux is going to have developmental delays. Um, what I'm saying is when those digestive issues start out early, almost every kid that I've ever, well, no, every kid I've ever seen with a developmental delay has a digestive issue. So that's what they have in common, but not every kid with reflux or picky eating is necessarily going to have a developmental delay, right? But every kid I've ever seen with a developmental delay has those things. So um, I would hedge your bets and get testing. Um, and our, our, if you wanted to come to us, our phone number's on the Facebook page and you could call and schedule with Patricia. And three years old, it's actually a really good age to do that. Yeah. It's early enough that you're going to, that you're going to avoid what's coming later on. Um, but it's a good age to where you can kind of get in there and help. Yeah. Well, as they get older, it gets a little bit harder with food. Yeah. You know, um, so this is another question uh for gluten-free kids if they've been exposed to gluten how can you tell as in what symptoms do you see them display because of unintended gluten digestion um that's a good that's a really good question that is, um kiddos display different they do it's different like i know some of our parents can tell right off the back because they start meltdowns, tantrums, stimming, not compliant, not stimming sleeping. nonstop. Yeah, exactly. So usually it gets, in, it's under four categories and I call this the four red flags. And I do, again, in my book, I write about all of this, but the four red flags are behavior changes. Um, and you should, you know, your kid well enough to know what that means, right? For you, uh, be, changes in food, eating, like all of a sudden they didn't want to eat much the next day. Um, stimming. Behavioral, that's oh, behavioral, okay. so stimming. Sleep, so they usually sleep through the night, now they're waking up at 5 a.m. And constipation. Yeah, and then pooping. So constipation, diarrhea, anything bowel-related that's funky. Um, not digesting, you know, undigested food in their stool, mucus, blood, any of that is, is fair game. I will tell you that 
a lot of people have food sensitivities to gluten, not a food allergy, meaning they can have a little bit of it and they're cool, but they have too much. And it's like, ee. but everybody's threshold's different. That's why everybody's symptoms are different. Yeah. You know, I can't have any gluten. It's, it's, I have a bile reaction to it and I don't have an allergy to it. I have a sensitivity to it, but I don't have an allergy. So everybody doesn't respond the same. Um, I think that I like all the kids to be gluten and casein free until they're two. And then I usually do testing to figure out how we should introduce gluten back in. Um, because that's a good way to kind of figure out, you know, there's a zillion different types of gluten, you know, wheat, oats, barley, you know, all kinds of fun stuff. So it's like, okay, can they have wheat and not barley? Can they have oat and not wheat? You know, saying they can go back to all gluten is highly unlikely. Yeah, it is very highly unlikely. So testing would tell you, but you could look at those four kind of categories of symptoms and see, you know, see what you think. But what I would do is I would do like an exposure, let's say on a Monday, wait two days, do another exposure, like on Thursday, it's usually that second exposure of gluten that's going to give you the symptom. And you're usually going to be able to see it from there, but don't do anything else around it. Don't start, don't buy a different brand of anything except the gluten thing that you're doing. And when I say exposure, I mean like a very minor exposure. I'm not saying go and let them go bonkers on a gluten, you know, pizza or have them eat like a 10 piece chicken nugget meal. Like that's overkill. Yeah. Um, and you could be up for days as a result of it. So just, just like, slide it in there, you know, even like a slice of toast for breakfast, more than enough. And then like on Thursday, something else. Some people kind of go bonkers with the whole reintroduction, reintroduction of gluten. So, um, yeah, but that's a really good question. I wish it was easier to answer. That's the best, that's the best I can give you. Hopefully that helps. Cheers. When did Axel, Cheers. so, Patricia uh, works for me. She's also a mother of a child on the autism spectrum. He's seven. Um, when did he start becoming a picky eater? I would say maybe a little bit after two. Because before then, he would eat everything and anything, which is not uncommon. Yeah. Now I know. Um, and then it was just one day he didn't take the sandwich that he would eat the day before and then he stopped taking the quesadillas my mom would make them and, and then he stopped taking the tacos yeah he ate tacos brisket tacos sweet tacos gosh your mom's home cooking he's mexican he doesn't even know how good he has it and then it just a little after a year i kind of it took me a while to notice it, and then after i noticed i was like what just happened like why you know it was the weirdest thing. It was literally overnight. Yeah. I mean, it probably wasn't. It was probably over time, but I noticed it like overnight. Like, yeah. At some point it gets to be where you can't ignore it. Yeah. I was talking earlier before you got here about how some of the signs can be even, you know, picky eating in relation to digestion, in relation to a kid who's not gaining weight. Like, you know, you don't have to buy new shorts this summer. Now Axel's on the other end. He's actually overweight. So you would think this boy eats everything that there is in sight. But Axel was not um, always like that. Oh, he wasn't? No. No, he was very, very, he was underweight two, three, four. Wow. He was always like very tall, but very underweight. Like, I think I went two summers without buying anything. Clothes wise, he was not always like that. It was like maybe five, six that he started shooting up. No, when he was younger, he was so skinny i felt bad i felt like they thought that i didn't feed him or anything I, I think a lot of we have a lot of people that bring their kids in f because of being underweight little little ones like a year to maybe right under a year old like they're not yeah really meeting their they're not getting to those milestones weight wise and it's a huge concern huge concern uh, mm -hmm. developmentally because their brain grows 50% the first year. So if it doesn't have the nourishment it needs, it's not really a wonder why I see a lot of kids that are developmentally delayed that also are picky eaters have digestive issues, right? Because they're not getting the nutrients that they need. Like Axel stayed at like 35 pounds for like two years. Like he wouldn't go up and he wouldn't go down. 
But he, I, and then all of a sudden, I was like, "Whoa, you're gaining weight now. What's going on?" He's always been tall. Yeah, he is. But tall. it's like the gaining weight. I mean, honestly, it it's was funny like, to see him next to you because he's tall. <laughs> Patricia's is not tall. I'm not. I'm the but opposite. she's an adult, so it's <laughs> weird to see a seven year old that's so tall. Like a I don't even think about it because I just know I've known him for so long. I feel like, but like my fam, I'm the shortest person in my family. I'm five seven. Everyone's really tall. My nephew is. Your sister. My tall. sister's super yeah. tall. She's six feet tall. My mom's five eleven. Well, my mom and my sister they say they're the same height, but I think my sister's taller. Yeah, I'm like. I say I'm, a, I'm the, like, the short person, the midget in my family at 5'7", but... but mean, she's really not. She's I'm really like normal not. normal height. I'm, I'm like, <laughs> like normal height. height. Yeah, I'm like normal. Someone said normal is 5'5". Five five, and I was like, oh, I'm killing it. Like, you really? Yeah, someone's... How tall are you? 5'4"? Five, I'm 5'0". Five I wish. You're not 5 feet tall. I am, dude. I am. I wish I was 5'4". <laughs> You're so cute. <laughs> I've never really paid attention. Oh, man. I know. 5'0". 5'0". I'm 5'0". You know, like later on in life, I learned that there was this hormone pill that maybe your parents would give you to like help you grow. I don't know if that's true, but I, I was like, my parents obviously no, don't love me. No, you wouldn't want that. <laughs> I was like, my parents obviously don't love me. So that's they just couldn't what help it. It's all about mixing of genetics, dude. I know. Yeah, I'm five zero. If I were healed, I would be like maybe five two, five three. Maybe. <laughs> Oh, I'll drink I don't. I don't like. Yeah, I know. Cheers. Did we cheers? We did in the beginning. We can do it's it again. Monday. So Patricia was late. She worked later than no, she was no. supposed to, and in turn, here we are. Here we are. So those are good questions. Um, so these are the questions that were sent in ahead of time. Oh, cool. Uh huh. Um, wow. Yeah. I answered all of these, but all of this was carbohydrates except for the yogurt, and I did mention the coconut yogurt. But have you found a good mac and cheese? Or is he not a mac and cheese eater? He's not a mac and cheese eater. You're lucky. Mm -hmm. I think that there's there's great rice pastas on the market. It's just the cheese that's the, the killer. Daya makes a great gluten-free pizza, gluten and casein-free pizza, but I don't particularly like their mac and cheese. So, But I like the Daya cheese that you buy in the dairy section that you put on like a sandwich or the shredded cheese that they make. So... I kind of tell people like get the rice pasta and then maybe use the diet shredded cheese and mix it up. But I mean, I don't know if that's going to be a disaster or what. That could work. I mean, it could work. I mean, beggars can't be choosers, but that's the one. There was one on the market a while ago and it, it, they went out of business. Of course they did bad marketing because they would have, they killed it. Really? It was a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, Annie's makes one, but it's not casing free. They just make gluten free. So don't let that fool you because the powder is dairy. Um, I'd say when people do a gluten and casein free diet, there's about a 70% improvement. You can tell, how can you tell Axel's had gluten? Yeah. Um, well, the first time that after we've actually was clean where I said was what can't talk today. <laughs> We're clean. <clears throat> he, there was a time he came home from school and he was just screaming and he was just crying and Axel's never really had meltdowns. Like, his meltdown says like, no, hey, he's chill. And he's, like, he's a really chill kid. He's a very like little even keel. Yeah. Like his meltdowns last like five seconds. That's why like in all eval paper, they're like meltdowns. And I'm always like, I don't know. <laughs> Unsure. <laughs> Unsure. I don't see. What that. did that mean? <laughs> <laughs> so he was having meltdowns and he was crying and screaming. And I remember I came to the office and I talked to you and I was crying because I was like, I've never seen my kid that way. Like, what just happened? It was like the demon was unleashed or something. Mm -hmm. It was bad. It was really, really bad. And then, um, and then after that, I mean, he's been exposed to gluten after, especially during this whole epidemic and my parents buying Fruit Loops and, you know, all that good stuff. Shoot um, me in the face. It hasn't been as bad, but I can tell because he's more hyper. Mm -hmm. And then, and now he'll tell me his belly hurts. So that's good. So, and he's been able to tell you that for a while, which is good. But I always say, if a kid, you know, he's on the autism spectrum. If we have a kid on the autism spectrum that's complaining about pain, that's legit. Yeah, because their pain tolerance so is high. a God-given gift. I it am, is out of control how much pain they can take without complaining. I remember one time we were at the playground, and he like, you know, those metal bars mm -hmm. that you climb on. He like hit his head, 
on that at like three and I was freaking out and I was like, oh my God, we need to go to the hospital. And he got up and he continued to play. And I'm like, dude, I remember, boy. <laughs> I remember hitting myself when I was like six or seven. The fact that I remember that is because it was that painful. He was just, he just got up and he was like, okay, let's keep it moving. But no, their pain tolerance is so, so high. It's, I thought, I like researched this. I was like, is my kid, what's up with this pain tolerance? Like. It's a thing. It's, yeah. But. Early. He's so nosy. We'll say hi. He's like, I don't really want to anymore. We went to a restaurant on Sunday called Lazy Dog in Addison. Because all of Addison is open. Yeah, and they have an amazing outdoor patio. And I didn't have his ID with me because I'd gone on a four mile walk, burn my carbohydrates. And um, I got him a meal because he didn't eat breakfast that day. And they have like a dog menu. No. So I just, yeah, so I got him just chicken and rice and they put some veggies in it. And I woke up this morning and he had barfed all over my rug. Oh. I know. Poor baby. But he ate dinner tonight, so he's doing okay. A little bit of diarrhea never hurt anybody? No, ma'am. No. So, um, let's see. I talked about feeding therapy. You never did feeding therapy, did you? Yeah, we are currently actually in feeding therapy. What? Mm -hmm. Did I not tell you that? No, for what? Yeah. Why? Because it's helped. It, it really depends on how aggressive the therapist is. Like, if she's, like, shoving food in your face then okay, don't do it. But this therapy, like, we've been doing it for, like, about a month or two. Um, and it's been, she's been really good on it. I like, wonder, she I has this, oh, sorry, go ahead. I just wonder, because, you know, we have so many parents that come in that feeding therapy has been useless. So my whole thing is, like, it's pretty useless because you're forcing a kid to eat things that causes them pain. However, Axel's different because Axel's been under care and he's clean. And they know not to feed him certain things. So that might be why it's different. I mean, we've tried feeding therapy in the past. Um, like, whenever we first started treatment with you. And we just couldn't. Like, he would be like, no. like yeah. So maybe it's different. Maybe if, maybe if they did feeding therapy, like, a after they've done cleaned up the gut and yeast and all the other things that could cause discomfort, then maybe it becomes more of a... Maybe they're more apt to try things because it's it's really how your therapy presents it. Like with Axel, we have this system. It's I love the system. It's see, touch, smell, kiss, lick, bite. It's so cool. So she never makes him even go. She she lets him go as far as he wants to go. So what he wants to do is look at it, and that's all we're doing. We're just gonna look at it that's good. until he's ready to smell it, and then. We can lick it, and then we can bite it, and blah, blah, blah. And they're staying within diet restrictions. Yeah, no, obviously. Okay, and um, what Axel does now, because he knows that he just goes straight to biting it. Like, I'm not going to do this anymore. This is boring, so I'm just going to bite it so he can stop. Like, feeding therapy is usually 30 minutes. We can get it done in, like, 10. Because so he goes straight to, like, biting. And if he doesn't like it, he'll be like, no thanks. <clears throat> you know? Yeah, he's still good manners. No thanks. I'm going to keep him that. But if he likes it, he'll, like continue eating it and he'll up and you know I'll ask him do you like it he's like it's okay <laughs> like it's okay it's not the best <laughs> so I can make you take two bites in the future and it'll be all good yeah yeah and he's been more compliant and I'm sure it's because he's been on the enzymes and the probiotics for so long and we've kind of cleaned up the diet he's more apt to try new things yeah like, see I'm don't... still gonna say I'm anti-feeding therapy without <laughs> without taking care of the root cause of pain I almost feel like it's borderline abusive yeah. To put a kid in pain and feeding therapy and force them to eat stuff. See, his therapist is saying, like, you do it on your own time. He's also seven. Some of these kids are in feeding therapy at two. They, they're not even oh, verbal. Oh, I, I wouldn't do it, actually. Yeah, they're not even verbal. No. And they just scream I the whole time. Actually. And I've had parents who are like, it's it's like, I feel like I'm, like, it's, a, I'm like, it's, they're it like, is. I feel bad. I feel like it's abusing them. I'm like, it kind of is because it's like, if you, if you had food poisoning and you had a little bit of the food left and someone forced you to eat it again, like, that's terrible. That's kind of what I compare it to. It can be, I know that might sound dramatic, but it's true. And yeah, I mean, I've seen them both ends, like. When I, well, like I told you, when we first started treatment, mm -hmm. we had attempted feeding therapy, and it was like murder. So I'm like, ah, cut right there. We're done. Yeah. No more. So maybe feeding therapy is a good idea later on. Later, whenever they feel better. Yeah. And, and Axel can tell me, I like it or I don't. 
Yeah. And if it's like, I don't like it, I don't make you try it. And that's just that. You know, you eat it and you say He's no. He's also a lot more verbal. So yeah. he, you know, he can say those things. And it's not just meltdown, screaming, crying oh, no, like some kids no. or okay. Because most of the time it just remains at meltdown I, city. I think if your child is nonverbal, I wouldn't do it. I'd feel bad about it. I would not do it because I would be scared. You're, are you crying because it hurts? Are you crying because, I mean, why are you crying, you know? Yeah, you don't know. It's like, do you just not want to be here because it legit hurts? I just wouldn't take the risk. Yeah, I'm with you. And, yeah, Axel's older, so we didn't try it again until he was seven. We, we tried at, at six, and I was like, no, cut. So it's like, uh, it's a whole year, and it made a huge difference. Like waiting that whole year. Well, there's been a lot of improvement in the last year. Yeah. Uh, across the board with him. Um, does anyone else have any questions about anything other than picky eating? Just anything in general? It's always nice to sort of take advantage of the time that we have. I think we're going to stay on. We're going to stay on for a couple more minutes, um, just to kind of discuss anything. Again, even if it's off topic, I just wanted to have a topic just so we had yeah. a starting point. But it's it's. For a game. Yeah, I don't care. And whatever you guys want to ask. There's nothing you about. can't ask us that we won't answer. Yeah. You might not like the answer all the time. Um, because I can't always give I can give better answers when I know their history and the and the child themselves, you know. But I think in general, I can give you pretty good advice on these calls because I've been doing this so long. And if I just say the majority, how would I answer? Yeah. I think I can pretty much you know, help you out because there is a majority that has certain features and has certain labs and has, you know, not that, I mean, I have some of the most severely developmentally delayed children that come in. And then I have another kid who's verbal and fine and their labs look 10 times worse than the kid who's severely developmentally it delayed. Thing, right? It's been happening a lot. That's lately. something that actually We've happens. been tripping out at work because yeah. I'll, I just, because I highlight everything for the parents just to sort of give them a global view of like what we're fixing over. We, we work, once we get labs back, we, we work on the labs, fixing the labs over a 90 day period. And so they can sort of get a global interpretation of like how messed up is messed up. So although Patricia has gone through these labs with her own kiddo, I don't expect her to know what they mean, but she knows when she sees it, when she sees everything highlighted. Um, we've talked about it a lot lately, how it's, you just, you never can tell by looking at a child how much, yeah, no. you know, how bad the labs are going to be. Honestly, it still surprises me sometimes. And it has lately. Cause I was like, Oh my God. Or she'll bring him into my office and be like, she slides him over to be like, mm, look at that. Look at this. <laughs> I'm like, Oh my God. Honestly, it is very fascinating to feel labs. Yeah. Cause it's like, there are certain kids that I'm like, Oh, you know, they're not, they, that, they're bad. not that bad. And then they yeah. come out, everything highlighted. I'm like, whoa just kidding <laughs> I should know better than to guess but yeah the kids have taught me many lessons through the years and that's one of them don't judge the book by the cover don't mm -mm. no I think labs are your best bet to kind of see what's going yeah. on inside and well, that's what I love about like the woman that wrote in with the three-year-old I think three is about the max you want to you want to wait to find answers because you've got you know six six months to a year of good repair time you know six months for sure because i don't know what else is going on but um i mean you could look up be entering pre-k like nothing ever happened you know and that's 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 the dream, that is the dream. i mean i don't want i don't want kids being diagnosed on the spectrum as soon as they get into school because they will i know they will be or like, they'll well. be in special ed or they'll be in a you know whatever and even though they're really smart and they might be able to read and they might be able to count and they might be able to do all the things they need to do. But there's, there's sometimes even behavior holds them back. I have a lot of kids who yeah. I would say, and Patricia can answer this, but I, in all the years I've been practicing when parents are like, when do, when do I call you? Um, now, right. It's like, well, if there's issues with behavior, food, appetite, right. Sleeping or bowel yeah. movements, those are the four reasons to call me. But I think the number one reason that drives you to pick up that phone is behavior. You know, I can't yeah. take it anymore. The school's calling me. They're telling me to get the kid on medication or else, or I can't handle the meltdowns or my child is starting to be aggressive towards their siblings or toward me or toward my husband. Um, behavior is usually the number one reason why people call. What would you say? I would say that's true. 
yeah. behaviorals, especially when they're in school already, because the school gives you two options, medication or medication. So Medication or homeschool? Me yeah, medication And everyone's homeschool. homeschooling right now. Do you really want to do that? No. No, <laughs> no we don't. I, Lord Jesus. I know. It's I pray killing. every night. I, I feel bad for Patricia because she doesn't have anyone to help her, you know? Um. Her mom watches this now. I mean, should. I her mom know. watches Axel, but her mom doesn't know how to use a computer, so it's tough because everything's on the computer. Now, truthfully, Axel knows exactly what to do, and he could get on there himself. But keeping him on task is is the problem. Like with every kid, because you will go on Nickelodeon. Oh, that's that's what I told Patricia. Why doesn't your mom just put him in front of the computer? He'll do his work. No, because he'll like turn the. Apparently, he turns the volume all the way down so she can't hear it, and then he goes on Nickelodeon or starts watching YouTube. You know, he did that in school. Like that's what one of the things his teacher told me all the time. Your kid will be on YouTube for God knows how long until I realize it. He's really because obsessed. I turn around with SpongeBob right now. Yeah, SpongeBob's the guy. It's real. He, I told you, right? He has this game where if he loses, he goes, "Oh, mm -hmm. barnacles." <laughs> <laughs> so funny to think. I'm gonna capture him one day. And, and, Please, and then I'm glad it's not like, oh, shit. you know, because well, like, what does barnacles really mean? I mean, yeah, but I think it's funny <laughs> that, like, yes, that he's making up like an appropriate cuss word. For a <laughs> and then at the end, he goes, "Go SpongeBob, go SpongeBob, go self." <laughs> yeah. Growing up in my house, I grew up with a truck driver father who, <laughs> you know, I'm surprised our first words were not the f bomb. So. You know, oh, barnacles. I know, oh, barnacles. I just don't know how everybody else's household was growing up, but mine was full of cursing. So, um, does anyone have any questions before you can private message um, us as well if you don't want to put it out? Or give us a call. Or give us a call. Mm -hmm. So, our phone number's on there. Um, we're open from 10 to 6, uh, Monday through Thursday. And we've been open the whole time. Yeah. Um, we don't double book. It's just us at the office. So you come in, you see us. Um, our cleaning hasn't really changed with this because we use hospital grade wipes that kill every virus, every bacteria. And then I also have a, um, a molecule. I was looking at the one I have. I have one in my, my apartment. Um, it's called a molecule with a K, not a C. I have one here at my house and I have one at the office and it kills everything, mold, viruses, bacteria, the whole nine. So we have that running in the office as well. Um, and that was actually for me because I had mold exposure last year and I got very sick. And so I had to make sure like we have, you know, you just don't know when you go to office in these buildings, how old they are, you That's know, they're true. 20, 30 years old, you know? So I, I just feel, I think in general, because I'm so conscientious of, you know, we can't control everything. I get it. But I mean, if you can buy it and, and put it in use, um, some, a, a kid from MIT actually developed the technology. Um, they're not cheap. <laughs> they're 800 bucks, but you can definitely like, but they're amazing. And you yeah. only have to change the filters out twice a year. You can feel the difference. I can. Yeah. Actually, Patricia said she could, and I had a patient come in, uh, Julia came in and she said, the air in here is just so crisp. It's so clean. You weren't there that I don't think you were there that she, had, she, she didn't mention it to me. Yeah. And I, I said, this is why. I'm like, you're not going to like the price of it, but it's, you know, it's about your health because it's, again, it's something we can control to a certain degree. Like the allergies have been so bad. I've been waking oh, up with headaches. Her, great, uh, Patricia and I have been having terrible headaches. I put this on boost in my bedroom the other day because I'm like, obviously something's coming through the vents. Um, and I didn't have a, I didn't have anything for three days until this morning. Really? Yeah. And then I woke up this morning and I was like, Ooh, yeah. I had to Sudafed it today for sure. Yeah. Sudafed's the way to go. Did you start, did you go get the Allegra? I did. Yeah. It'll give it like three or four days, but do not it's, forget to take it. It's been helping today. They were not bad yesterday. They were okay. It took like four but or five days and then I was like, wait a second. I noticed the difference. There. You do. It's getting there. Yeah. I don't like that. It only comes in 15 capsules and I have to go like I'm a meth user and get it at the pharmacy and give I them know. my ID. It's like, I don't want to make meth. I just can't want you, my allergies. Can't you just give me a 30 day supply? Why do I have to come here every two weeks? Like I promise you, I am not selling this out there. <sighs> I, know. I know. Today I had to go to the drive. So it's nice. You can go, at least you can go to the pharmacy drive through and get it. Cause it's behind the counter. You don't have to go in. She's like, do you want, uh, like, I don't know. She asked me if I want like 
eight pills or 15. I'm like, I want the like, 30. Yeah, I want <laughs> eight so I can come back in a week. Like, what? I know. It would be crazy. I wanted you to get Allegra D, and then I wanted you to get a 12 hour Sudafed because I will, I will pack those. So I'll do Allegra D at night, and then in the morning, if it's really bad, like it was this morning, I'll do a Sudafed. Everyone's different, but I do the sinus and congestion one, and it works really nicely. Um, yeah, but they've been better for the kids. We use natural stuff, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a great spray I've used for years called X Clear. It's the it's X and clear, and they have a pediatric nasal spray, and it's xylitol. And xylitol has been proven to help with allergies. Oh, really? Mm hmm. I used it back before I had sinus surgery. And I mean, I was, I was getting sinus infections all the time before I had surgery, but now I think it's just regular allergies. It's just kind of a beating. And I use these eye drops, the pharmacist recommended, and that helps a lot because all the, I get, I don't get watery eyes or some sneezing or whatever. Dry I get, eyes. I get these, uh, my eyeballs ache. Yeah. I mean, they just ache. And then of course, all of us are on the computer all day. Um, and it's, it's just terrible. So I've been putting these eye drops in and it just like relieves my eyes. It stings a little. But then it goes away, and it's it's very nice. Oh man, you have to show me that. Yeah, they're in my bedroom. I'll show you before you go. Cause I just get like the tired eye from Vision or Vizio, whatever that brand is. That helps a little bit. You got like in an hour, drops, apparently. Really? Yeah. Cause in an hour, I'm like, oh, I get everything. Allergies have been bad. I don't know if it's because I'm getting old or just because. I, I feel like it's, I don't, I think it might be really bad this year because I keep getting, Alexa keeps giving me pollen alerts, which I have not gotten before. And my phone really? is doing the same. Yeah. Like high pollen today. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, great. Mm, awesome. I mean, I wake up and my eyes are swollen. I look like I was up all night long and I wasn't clearly mm -hmm. having a good time or doing anything fun. <laughs> just trying to sleep, just trying to go to work, not looking all gross. Um, anybody have any questions before we get off for the night or could you also private message me if there's a topic you guys want to talk about? We'll probably do another one in two or three weeks. Um, Patricia's son is almost done with school, so that'll probably be easier to wait till he's out of school before we do another one. Um, but if you have any topics or have anything you want us to talk about, we could talk about a bunch of stuff, obviously, because we do it for an hour. Please send me a private message and let me know what you'd like to talk about or what you uh, what you're interested in learning more about so that we can be here for you because that's why we're here. We're just here to help you guys out with whatever questions you have and yeah. um, and try to get you on the right path if possible. So again, we're at the office. Um, so give us a call if you want. You can also send us an email. Our email address is on the Facebook page as well. So I know everybody's going a little crazy, homeschooling, working, trying to maintain their sanity. <laughs> I mean, I'm going out of the house. The restaurants and bars are opening. I was out Thursday in Highland Park Village, having a cocktail on the patio. It was amazing. It was life-changing. <laughs> it felt so good. I was like, this feels so good to be I, out. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, I went out, I went out Thursday, Friday, Friday? Sunday. Saturday and Sunday. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Restaurants are working like at like low capacity, but I went to Perry Saturday night on a date and we just kind of sat, like they, they had, they had the tables, you know, they weren't seating all the tables. It was very spaced out. Um, but it was nice. It was nice to get out. It's very, very nice to get out and feel like a human. I know. I think we're all over it. Go on a real date. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Have a real, like, adult cocktail outside of Mikasa. Mm -hmm. Okay, ladies, remember, skinny girl, peach margarita. This is the jam. It's really good. It's really good. It's not too sweet. I don't like sweet stuff. No, it's not too sweet. This is about as sweet as I would drink. It's I'm really not, nice. Not a fan of sweet stuff. Me neither. Yeah, but this is mild. They have regular margarita. They have a spicy margarita if you're into that, but that upsets my tummy. That was a spicy margarita? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there is an app that you can order liquor from. Hold on. Don't get off yet. Let me tell you. You'll thank me later. Hold on. It's called Drizzly, D-R-I-Z-L-Y. And you can put in what you want, and then it'll shop the cheapest price closest to you. Really? Mm-hmm. Yep. And they'll deliver it to you within an hour. So if you're still not wanting to leave the house, don't you worry. Drizzly's you don't, got you. Drizzly's got you. 
And then also uh, favor, favor will deliver anything. I had him deliver me groceries today, but that's because I was on a, a continuing education course and, and really quite frankly, I hate to grocery shop. Okay. I just hate it. Yeah. I'll pay the $4. I mean, all I needed would pair, was pears and coffee creamer, but trying to do low sugar, low sugar fruits. Yeah. And I don't like to buy berries because it's, I just don't. Berries are the best. They're the best low sugars. The organic stuff's expensive and it molds and I'm not into it. It's overpriced. Well, you have to eat it in like two days. Yeah. So I've been having a pear or a gala apple. Those are the apples I like. They're not too, they're a little sweet, but they're not too sweet. So I like those. And then my coffee creamer is a mix of almond and coconut milk. It's by Califia Farms. They only sell it at Whole Foods. They don't sell it like at Tom Thumb or Kroger yet. It's annoying. It's really good. It's really good. It's very thick. Yeah. So it's like, it's good for like as a half and half or to bake with or whatever. So I love it. So I was like, well, if I'm getting it delivered, I'll just get two of them today. I'll Might feel like, well. I'll feel like the, the guy that did it was worth it. <laughs> I was like, just deliver me creamer and pears. Cause I go to snaps kitchen for all my other food right now. Cause I can control like how much protein, carbs, fats I'm eating. And I love snaps kitchen cause everything's gluten free and it's delicious. It's really good. And I have like a very well balanced meal that's fresh. What I want to eat, I can't because that's what happens in your forties in case all of you listening don't know that. So if you don't know it, well, just get ready. It's not fun. Not excited at, at all, but it took me this long to get to the point where I had to watch what I ate. So I guess I, should, I guess I should be thankful. That's, yeah. I got to do it over 40 years. So there you go. I should be thankful, but boo, <laughs> but boo now, but boo now. Boo now. Yeah, I wish I could like eat pizza. Gluten and casey free pizza, but pizza nonetheless. Anyway, um, thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll see you guys in a couple weeks. We're gonna wait for school to get out and then do another one probably the first or second week of June. So um, in the meantime, if you wanna send us private messages on things that you wanna do, I'd appreciate it because we're here to service you guys. So whatever you want to know about, at least give us a direction so we know what to do for the next one. All right, guys. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Bye.